Yeah, I'm Ali Smith. I work here at the Cornell Lab in Ithaca, New York, as part of the Merlin team. Um, and tonight, I am very excited to introduce uh, Merlin Bird ID Trivia, uh, where over the next hour, we'll have a Bird ID expert um, in the audience here. And all of you, um, everyone else I watching, maybe um, you can do it through my phone. We'll be competing together um, against Merlin to see who can identify the most birds correctly. Um, and we're also celebrating if, the backyard bird count, to do it that way. which begins hey. next week. One second. Uh, Char and Char Charlie, mute yourself. <laughs> the Great Backyard Bird Count um, begins next week. Um, it's uh, a four day long event that anyone anywhere in the world can participate in. Um, and all you need to do is watch birds for at least 15 minutes during those four days and then uh, identify the birds you see and submit your sightings to eBird or using Merlin. And to learn more, um, you can visit birdcount.org. And I'll also have a slide up at the end of the presentation to learn a little bit more as well. Uh, so let's get started with trivia. Um, so Merlin is powered by eBird, which is a citizen science platform where you can record lists of birds that you find when you go birding. To help us manage data quality for eBird, we have a network of almost 3,000 volunteers around the world who review reports of rare birds and unusual sightings. And our competitor today is Kyle Bardwell, which is uh, who's one of your local eBird reviewers for the Hudson Valley area. Um, so Kyle, I think you were on here somewhere. I saw your name. Hey, Allie, how are you? Hey, awesome, welcome. Um, Kyle, how are you feeling about taking on Merlin today? Good, good. Um, you know, Sean Camilleri is also on the on the chat. We weren't sure if he's going to make it tonight, but he's also the eBird reviewer uh, down here. Um, so obviously, we're constantly sending emails to people telling them that they're using eBird uh, Merlin and it's wrong. So I think everyone's on here tonight to watch me maybe get beat up a little bit by Merlin and a little bit of you know <laughs> payback, I guess you would say. So um, yeah, looking forward to it. Appreciate you having me. Awesome. Um... I, yeah, I can't wait to see how everybody does. All right, so I'm going to share my screen so everybody can see the rules. And we can get started. All right, can everyone see the correct screen? Yes, okay. All right. Um, Welcome to Trivia. Um, so here's how the game will work. Uh, we will have 14 questions, and for each question, I'm going to show a photo of a bird or play a recording of a bird song. And Merlin and Kyle will each have 30 seconds to decide on an answer, and then everyone in the audience watching on Zoom uh, will also have 30 seconds to choose your answer from a poll that's going to show up on your screen. Uh, behind the scenes, we also have Evan, also from the Cornell Lab on the Merlin team, who's going to be running the polls and making sure they show up at the right time. Um, all of the species that um, are in the questions tonight are birds that you could see in the Hudson Valley during the Great Backyard Bird Count next weekend. Um, and then after those 30 seconds are up, we'll close the polls. Everyone will share their answer, and whoever gets it correct will get a point. And whoever has the most points at the end uh, will win. So uh, we're going to begin with a photo ID round. Um, the first 10 questions are going to be based on photo ID. And identifying a bird visually is a, it's a really important skill for birding that Kyle probably uses every time he goes birding. Uh, when Kyle finds a bird, he's probably looking for the, the size and the shape of the bird, along with different colors or patterns, maybe the length of the bird's bill or other visual field marks that he can use to identify it. And Merlin actually acts in a really, really similar way. Merlin's ability to identify birds in photos starts with the Macaulay Library, which is where media submitted to eBird checklists is archived. We've recently reached 50 million photos of birds and just over 2 million sound recordings, almost all of which have come through eBird. Um, so we have an incredible amount of data here to work with. To train photo ID, uh, volunteers drew thousands and thousands of boxes around birds in hundreds of thousands of photos. Um, and within those boxes identified the birds that were boxed. And then we passed all of that training data onto our machine learning team, uh, where our researchers use these box images to create a machine learning model um, called the convolutional neural network that can identify birds in photographs. And just like the way that you would identify a bird, um, convolutional neural networks are able to extract features in a bird like their size and shape and color and recognize patterns in those features that correspond to a particular species. And in, in particular, it recognizes two different types of features, um, coarse-grained and fine-grained features. And a coarse-grained features are bigger scale features, like kind of your first impression of a bird, like maybe where the red is on a northern cardinal. 
And fine-grained features are smaller features, like um, the way you might think about sparrow identification, where like really subtle color pattern differences can help you differentiate between two different species. So if we're all feeling ready, uh, we can jump in with our first question. So here's our first question. We'll, we'll say you're out, you're, uh, maybe you're inside your kitchen and you look outside your window to your bird feeders and you see this little bird sitting on top. What species is this? Here are the options. We'll have the poll show up. You can all vote. I'll give you all 30 seconds to vote. You can click on the answer you think is correct on the screen. We'll give Kyle some time to consider this bird. And you want a, you want a verbal answer for me, Alec? Yes, but I want you to, um, after after 30 then. seconds or so, or, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll close the polls and then I'll, I'll get a, an answer, a verbal answer from Kyle. All right, a couple more seconds. Looks like the audience is pretty much in agreement here that this might be an American goldfinch. We want to end the poll. Kyle, what do you think this species is and why? I, I agree with the mass on American goldfinch. And I feel like this is a perfect plumage of a, a picture I get sent from my mom or like my family. And they're like, what is this bird? I'm like, that's a, a goldfinch. And they're like, no, goldfinch are always yellow and bright. It's like, no, in certain, you know, at certain times of the year, they obviously, the males will lose their breeding plumage um, and show kind of a variation in, you know, color. Um, same with the females, they can vary throughout the year. So that kind of beige is tan you'll expect to see on a, a goldfinch around this time of year, especially. Um, so I agree, I agree with the crowd. All right, let's see what Merlin had to say. Merlin is in agreement that Merlin thinks this is a goldfinch, and congratulations, everybody gets a point. Everyone got it correct. This is, in fact, a goldfinch. Um, and I do want to note, this is a really great photo um, for Merlin to use. Um, the bird is very clear. It's a great picture. Um, it's in a really, like, normal pose. Like, it's it's just perching. It's a pose you normally see goldfinches in. Um, nothing's obscuring the bird. There's no sticks in front of it. You can see the entire bird, including the head and the beak and the tail. Um, so this is a really easy photo for Merlin to identify. So moving on to question number two. We're going to stick to the bird feeders, and there are two birds in this picture, but I want you all to identify the one that's on the left. But we'll turn the polls on and give you some time to answer here. Who is this little guy on the left? All right, we've got about 10 seconds left to vote. All right, and time is up. All right, looks like almost everybody was in agreement again. Um, the masses say that this might be a downy woodpecker. Um, Kyle, what do you think about this bird? Uh, this is a tough one, you know, um, and I feel, I'm kicking myself a little bit because um, you know, a lot of times when you distinguish between hairy and downy, you're looking at the length of the bill, you're looking at, you know, size compared. To, it's hard to tell with the size compared to the pileated, but it looks small to me. Um, and then another key feature to distinguish the hairy and downy, and I'm blanking on it now, which one is which, is you're looking for spotting on the outer tail feather. And I forget which one goes which. So for this, I was going to go with downy woodpecker based on the size comparison with the pileated not seeing the beak and, and kind of forgetting about that outer tail feather spotting. So. All right, we'll, we'll see what Merlin has to say. Merlin is agreeing with all of you that it's a downy. And again, nice work. Everyone got it. Awesome. Making sure everyone gets their points written down. All right. Okay, so we've had two feeder birds so far, um, but sometimes your bird feeders attract more unexpected guests. Um, sometimes a bird like this shows up and it might stop by for some hunting. Um, so what species do you think this might be? We'll turn the polls on and give you 30 seconds to vote. Ooh, people are feeling a little more divided on this one.
All right, we'll give you about 10 more seconds. And time is up. All right, so a little more than half of the audience voted for Cooper's hawk, but a quarter of the audience voted for sharp-shinned hawk, too. Um, and those are really tricky birds um, to identify and pick apart. Uh, Kyle, what do you think this bird is? I, I want to start off with uh, everyone narrowed it down to the, uh, the occipiter family. And I tell everyone that experts will make mistakes on sharp-shinned hawk versus Cooper's hawk in their lives. So do not feel bad about this. Um, this is probably the most common, you know, bird that comes in the review queue that gets flagged by other observers. Um, this photo shows a pretty clear uh, Cooper's hawk with real fine teardrop streaking down the breast. Um, obviously, everyone kind of went into it with the sipiter, probably because of the long tail, you know, overall features. Um, this also shows a kind of a elongated neck with a, you know, slightly square head to it. it doesn't show as you know, a flat head as some of them will, but um, it shows a lot of the key variables for a Cooper's hawk. Um, it doesn't have that big boggy eye. It doesn't have a very small uh, hooked bill. Uh, it fits pretty well with a Cooper's hawk. All right, that, that's a great description. Um, and Merlin is agreeing with everyone that this is a Cooper's hawk. And again, nice work. Everybody gets a point. I think this is showing that... Um, it's good to go birding with friends, even if there's some divided opinions. Uh, the, you know, hive mind of 65 birders all voting is getting the correct answer every time so far. That's pretty cool. Um, all right. Um, oh, and, and another note on how Merlin is picking this apart. Like you said, like Sharption versus Coopers is a really, really challenging um, ID that even experts get wrong pretty often. Um, but this is a great example of where Merlin's machine learning model is using fine-grained features to identify the bird. Uh, like just like with what Kyle said, it's it's very similar to sharpshin hawks, but there's some difference in the the shape of the streaking on the chest or the size of the bill, maybe the shape of the eye, um, and those are the really subtle fine grain features that Merlin is keying in on when it's trying to identify this bird. So moving on back to the bird feeder, uh, we have a flock of birds this time. Um, so this is all the same species here. All four birds are the same. Uh, what species are these? We'll turn on the polls and give you all 30 seconds to answer. All right, we'll give you 10 more seconds. All right, and time is up. All right, the masses have decided that this is a house finch. Kyle, do you agree with that? I, I do agree with that. At first, I wanted to note that it looks like this photo might be Alexander Rabs. And uh, I believe that's probably the Alexander Rab who's a sawmill uh, member. So kind of cool that that came up. Um, but yeah, this is a pretty classic um, house finch. Again, this is another one that you know, a lot of people can easily, you know, mess up on and something that we see a lot in the review queue. Um, you're looking at really strong streaking down the sides. Um, on the males, you'll see that there's very little reds extending down the backs. Um, everything here is, fits well for a house finch. Um, you're not seeing those blocky uh, facial markings of the, the males and the females for that matter. Um, so yeah, it's good with house finch on this one. All right, and and oh, and as a note, I did try my best to only choose photos that were taken in the Hudson Valley area. So yes, that this should be the uh, the Alexander Rab you're talking about here. Cool. Um, so let's see what Merlin has to say. Merlin's agreeing again that this is a house finch, and nice work, everybody got it right. Um, so here's another species that Merlin's really keying into those fine grain fe uh, features um, of especially like the markings on the face, the amount of red on the, on the bird, the little bit of streaking on the chest. Um, so for our next question, we're gonna stick with the bird feeder. And uh, maybe you look outside and you see all these birds sitting on the platform. And we've already identified the guy in the back. We already know that that's a goldfinch. Um, but what about these two blurry birds in the front? What species are they? 
we'll turn the polls on and give you 30 seconds. Ooh, there's some divided opinions for this one. All right, time is almost up. A few more seconds. All right. This one's fun. We have almost equal number of guesses for purple finch and pine siskin. Kyle, what do you think about these birds? Again, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna blame anyone here for saying pine siskin. That you know, I can see why someone would say there might be a little bit of yellow in those wings. Um, but you know, kind of good to have this one right after the house finch because um it really shows those strong facial markings of a purple uh, female purple or immature male purple finch. Um, you can see that really almost like a white eyebrow that extends down the back, kind of making it almost like a, um, you know, like a real strong face patch on this bird. Opposed, to you you know, went back slide alley, you can kind of see that the female on the other screen didn't have that strong white malar bar. Um, so, and also another aspect that you can also see is you can pretty see that peaked head of the purple finch. Whereas I find house finch always to have that very rounded head. You know, th those are great descriptions. Um, Merlin had an interesting take on this bird. Merlin thought that these were both common red poles. I tried Merlin on both of these blurry birds. Merlin was voting for red pole, um, but Kyle is right. And the audience is right too. There were slightly more votes for purple finch is the correct answer here. Uh, but this is a really fun example to show where, where Merlin does really struggle. Um, Merlin has a really hard time with blurry photos in particular. Um, even though these finches are, they're distinct enough that Kyle could identify it by that, that really bright white eyebrow um, and the maybe the shape of the head. It's just a little bit too out of focus for Merlin. Uh, we could potentially improve Merlin's chances of getting this one correct by intentionally training it on blurry photos of, of purple finches. Um, maybe that's something that could come in the future, but for now, this one's just a little bit too smudgy. And um, speaking of smudgy, for our next question, here's a very smudgy bird. I promise there's actually a bird in this picture uh, right in the middle here on the tree trunk. It's very well camouflaged. What species do you think this is? Turn on the poles and give you all 30 seconds to think about this and answer. But the audience is feeling very confident about this one. All right, we'll give you a few more seconds. And we'll say time is up. All right, okay, almost every single person voted for brown creeper in the audience. Kyle, what do you think about this? Yeah, first a little shout out to Anthony, my, my boy right there. So that's cool to see a photo from him coming up. Um, so I agree on uh, brown creeper. I think this is probably a, a perfect photo describing like what a brown creeper is. Uh, you know, a lot of times it takes a while to find them when they're when you point them out to other people. Um, their camouflage is perfect. Obviously, it's a very tiny bird with a very needle-like bill, um, and it's doing exact posture that it always does. That's um, you know going up a, tr a tree trunk. So you always see its back just like that it blends perfectly into a tree. Um, you know, the other options here, Carolina Wren, House Wren, or White Road Sparrow. Um, you know, Carolina Wren would obviously look much more, you know, Rufus. Uh, House Wren, you're going to have a similar bill, I guess, but, you know, back pattern would be completely different. You wouldn't see it kind of climbing a tree. Same with the White Road Sparrow. So. Yeah. All right. And Merlin is agreeing with you all that this is a brown creeper and everyone got it right. And um, to be totally honest, I'm astounded that Merlin got this one. That was really cool to see um, that Merlin was able to, to figure this one out, even though it was so well camouflaged. And another um, kind of cool, like behind the scenes, how Merlin works. Um, Merlin goes through a couple steps when it's identifying a bird. And the first thing it does when it's presented with a picture is um, it uses the 
the bird detector part of Merlin, which is exactly what it sounds like. It just figures out where in the photo the bird is. Um, so like we, you, you notice we, we had volunteers drop boxes around where the birds are in photographs and Merlin is using specifically that, that boxing action that um, to figure out uh, as training data to figure out where the bird is in this picture. So I'm assuming the the uh, bird detector part worked very well in here. It did find the bird. And then after that, it uses those coarse and fine grain features to identify it as a brown creeper. So, so that's pretty fun. Uh, we have another very well camouflaged bird for our next question. Um, on the ground, um, not on a tree. Maybe this one's hopping around on the ground below your bird feeders. What is this cute little bird here? We'll bring up the poll and give you 30 seconds to answer. We'll give you all 10 more seconds. Some good mixed answers here. Sparrows are definitely a tricky group. All right, and time is up. All right, definitely some divided opinions here um, in the audience, but um, almost everybody voted for Fox Sparrow. Kyle, what do you think about this bird? I I agree with the, I agree with the gang. Um, you know, this is this is one of my favorite sparrow species. Um, you know, all the, the species listed would, you know, be on the ground in a habitat like this. Um, so really what you're doing to tell this apart from the others is it's real strong uh, rufous colors. It's strong rufous spotting on the flanks. And uh, one of my favorite parts about that bird is that is that gray nape, almost like a clay colored sparrow would have. Um, real nice bird. This is the, you know, the subspecies that we see around here. Again, nice to see a photo from Leon, a very active eBird user in our area. Um, so I did take a quick look to make sure it didn't, didn't fit a city subspecies race. Um, so yeah, this looks like your classic Eastern, uh, red fox sparrow. All right. And Merlin is in agreement with you all that this is a fox sparrow. And again, nice work. Everybody got this one right. Awesome. All right. We have another pretty well camouflaged bird for the next one. We're going to stick with the, the tiny brown bird, uh, category here. Uh, maybe not so tiny as the fox sparrow, but here's another bird that you could see on the ground below your bird feeders. What is this species? I'll give you all 30 seconds to answer. Some good divided opinions again. A couple more seconds. And we'll say time is up. All right, so some divided opinions here, um, but the majority of the audience voted for a red-winged blackbird. Kyle, what do you think about this one? First, first, Ali, I appreciate you giving me these birds so far. I was a little worried uh, when I woke up this morning what I was getting into tonight. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm at least happy that I'm able to get some of these. Um, this one is another one of those classic, uh, you know, photos you get a lot from people. They're like, what is this bird? Uh, is this a rusty blackbird? Is this a yellow-headed blackbird? And um, yeah, it's this weird plumage of a red-winged blackbird, uh, you know, female type that they could show some like yellow kind of near the lures. Um, they can have some weird coloring on the back, uh, almost like a, you know, a rusty blackbird, I guess, would show on the back with some red tones on it, some weird things. Um, so you see this one a lot. So anyone that didn't get this right, again, this is one of those ones that a lot of people um, can mess up on just because of the weird plumage and different color variations you can find in these types of birds. All right. Yeah, this is definitely a species that really tripped me up when I was new to birding, especially when they're really far away. Um Merlin is agreeing with you that this is a red-winged blackbird. Um, and again, everyone got a point here. Everyone got it right. Nice work. 
All right, we have two more photo-based questions, and then we're going to switch to sound. Um, so I've shown you all um, really, like, beautiful, like, crisp, clear photos um, of birds, for the most part, in focus. Um, but I think photography is really fun because sometimes you get these really stunningly clear photos like this one of this blackbird. Um, and then sometimes you get pictures like this, uh, which is really stunning in, in many in a very, very different way. <laughs> so here's here's a really cool bird that's launching itself off of the bird feeder and flying straight at you. This is the bird's head we're looking at here. What species do you think this is? We'll bring up the poll and give you 30 seconds to vote. Some more good divided opinions in the voting here. I'll give you a few more seconds. All right, and time is up. So about half the audience voted for red-breasted nuthatch, but a good number of folks voted for black-capped chickadee. Kyle, what do you think about this one? Yeah, you know, um, you know, Sean's on this chat too. He's another eBird reviewer in our region, and you know, half of our job is looking at blurry photos um, <laughs> on a daily basis. I mean, it, and you know what? We appreciate it. You know, we always tell people to you know do whatever they can to document, even if it's a very poor photo. So we were looking at a photo of a, a gold today that was digi scoped and very poor. So um, that kind of training as an eBird reviewer actually helped me a lot with these type of fun pictures. So. Um, this shows one of my favorite birds, which is the red-breasted nuthatch. Um, and it shows that beautiful kind of uh, slate-colored back, almost like a adult male Merlin, a blue jack would show. Um, it shows that real contrasting heavy black head with, you know, white eye stripes, as well as you can see some of that orange tint of why they call it the red-breasted nuthatch. So even though it's a poor photo, it does show enough of those field marks that you can discern it. I love this picture so much. I think these birds would be so much scarier if they were if they were bigger than they were. Um, Merlin is in agreement that this is a nuthatch. I, again, another one that I was honestly astounded that Merlin got right. Um, it is a red-breasted nuthatch. Um, so this is um, this is such a distinct-looking bird that Merlin can use its coarse grain features um, to identify it. Those really, really bold patterning on the bird's head is is pretty unique um, and really stands out. So I, th I think that's what Merlin is cueing in on. And all right, we have one more photo question to go. So let's say you're watching your bird feeders and you see a kind of unusual looking bird hopping around on the ground. And that bird looks like this. What species do you think this is? We'll turn on the polls and give you 30 seconds to answer. Again, some divided opinions in the in the poll here. Give everyone a few more seconds to vote. All right, and time is up. All right. Looks like the audience, most of the audience voted for snow bunting, um, but a good number also voted for white-throated sparrow. Kyle, what do you think about this this unusual looking bird here? Yeah, so these, um, these, uh, I forget the word off the top of my head or how to pronounce it, but um, these birds that lack pigment, I guess you would say, are, are tough ones for uh, many different observers. So a lot of times we see um, what uh, white faced jeer falcon reports on eBird. And a lot of times they end up being um, red tailed hawks. And so this one was tough because when I first looked at it, I was actually debating in my head whether it was a, a junco or a white throated sparrow. And luckily junco wasn't on the list. So I was <laughs> able to, to be for sure it was a white throated sparrow. And after that, 
it actually makes sense. Yes, leucistic. I'm sorry about that. Um, so yes, this is a leucistic bird that doesn't show, you know, all proper pigmentation. Um, but after I realized it was a white throated sparrow, it makes sense because sometimes they will show a little bit of color. And it looks like this one's actually holding on to its yellow eyebrows that a, you know, a, an adult male white throated sparrow would show. So yeah, just by um, shape and size, um, snow buntings you would never see, you know, eat sunflower at a bird feeder, at least sitting in the Hudson Valley probably. Um, so I was able to narrow that down and all right. No, the very very good reasoning there. It is a leucistic bird. Um, and Merlin had a really creative answer here. Merlin decided that this was a herring gull. And I kind of love that answer because um, honestly, like so Merlin doesn't have that size reference. So like if you look at a tiny, tiny bird at your feeder, you know that there's no way that's a gull because gulls aren't, you know, three inches tall. Um, but Merlin doesn't have that context. And Merlin here, I think, is, is cueing in on that little bit of yellow on the face, maybe the darker wing tips and the pink legs. And honestly, that matches really well with the description of a herring gull other than the size. Um, so Mer Merlin did get this one very wrong. Um, it is a white-throated sparrow. It's a leucistic bird. Um, and I think Merlin got this wrong, um, mostly because we haven't trained it in identifying leucistic birds. Uh, we've trained Merlin using thousands and thousands of images of white-throated sparrows, but none of them were leucistic in the way that this one was. So Merlin's never seen this type of plumage before. Um, so there is no chance that Merlin could get this one right. Uh, so that that's a that's a really cool example, um, and also a good way to show that this is these are really challenging birds um, for human birders too. Like this, if you saw this little this little tiny white bird bouncing around on the ground below your feeders, it'd probably take you a little bit to figure out what it was. Um, so, uh, big big thank you to uh, the photographer here for for getting such a great picture of this. Um, so, we'll give Kyle a point for that. Uh, I'm so sorry, audience, you do not get a point for that one. Um, but that does bring us to our score check. Um, so that's the end of the photo ID round. Um, Merlin got eight correct. The audience has nine correct. And Kyle's got 10 out of 10 correct so far. Um, so nice work. Uh, but we do still have four questions left. So we're going to jump into sound ID. Um, these last four questions will be based on sound. And sound ID is pretty new in Merlin. Um, photo ID is actually about eight years old already. Um, and it's getting a, an update coming soon this spring, which is pretty exciting. Um, but sound ID is only about three years old. And it works re in a really similar way to photo ID. So instead of using photos of birds, um, sound ID uses spectrograms, which is a way to visualize sound to identify different species. Each species of bird makes a unique shaped spectrogram, um, a unique shaped mark on, um, on the screen here. Um, so to train Merlin, we review sound recordings um, made by e-birders all around the world and draw boxes around where each bird is singing in the spectrogram. And then our machine learning engineers use these boxes to train a computer model and then you get Merlin. Uh, so right now Merlin can identify just about every North American bird by sound. Um, but just like with photo ID, it, it can certainly make mistakes. Uh, so we are gonna put it to the test here. So here's question one. Uh, we'll say it's nighttime and you can't see anything. And you're outside in your yard and you hear a bird calling from the woods. We'll open up the polls and I will play the sound a couple times. So play, this one's a very short recording. So I'll play it three times um, to give you all time to answer. So I will play it once now. <laughs> So I played it once. You may need to turn your volume up if it's quiet for you. It is a little bit of a quiet recording. All right, I'll play it one more time. All right, give everyone a couple more seconds to get their votes in. And time is up. All right, looks like uh, about 75% of the audience voted for great horned owls, but there were some votes for barred owl as well. Kyle, what do you think about this sound? Yeah, um, you know, being in the Hudson Valley, we only need to really learn like five species of owl call. So, um, you know, on the list here, um, the screech owl does more of a, you know, almost like a horse whinny or a trill. Um, Bard Owl does your classic, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. Um, so when you hear those, those deep hoots, you know, you're looking at a, 
likely a great horned owl. Long-eared owls will do a, a hoot call, but this one matches very well with a great horned, you know, kind of like a three-note hoo-hoo-hoo. And um, if it was a long-eared owl, I'd be wondering uh, where, where in the Hudson Valley we're, we're hearing that. So that would be a good one to hear in the Hudson Valley. So uh, with that, i go with great horned owl. All right, let's see what Merlin had to say. Merlin's agreeing with you that it's a great horned owl and nice work. It is, in fact, a great horned owl. Um, so this is another great example of a recording that Merlin found easy to identify. Um, the great horned owl makes a pretty unique sound. It has a unique looking spectrogram. Um, not much else around um, the Hudson Valley area it really sounds like that. And the quality of the recording was pretty good. Um, there really wasn't a lot of background noise. I think there was maybe an airplane going overhead or something, but it's not like you were recording in the middle of a city and there's a lot of other competing noise. It was pretty clear. Um, so Merlin had a pretty easy time getting this one right. So for our next question, uh, we're back at the bird feeders. And uh, maybe your feeders are empty, but you're hearing a bird from up in the nearby trees. What species is this one? I'm going to play it twice for you. This is a little bit of a longer recording. I really love the shape of this, uh, the spectrogram on this one. I'll play it one more time to give you more time to vote. All right, a couple more seconds to get your votes in. I love the, again, very divided opinions in the, in the audience here. Another good bird to get some practice for before the Great Backyard Bird Count begins. All right, we will say time is up. And we have almost an even split here between red-breasted and white-breasted nuthatch. Both really good guesses. A uh, couple more people voted for red-breasted nuthatch. Um, Kyle, what do you think about this? Um, you know, I think, you know, by the end of the recording, I was starting to get a little annoyed by that yanking call in my ear, which is, uh, you know, whenever I go up to the Adirondacks from Vermont, when you hear a red-breasted nuthatch for the first time, it's cool, and you get excited. And then after hours of yanking, you know, you start to get a little annoyed. So, um, yeah, it was pretty, you know, real force, you know, call it yanking call, he would say, uh, opposed to a white-breasted, which is a lot less um, fierce in that call. Um, but definitely a nuthatch, and then, you know, very much so a red breasted with how consistent and strong that Yankee call was. All right. And Merlin is agreeing with you that this is a red breasted nut hatch. And nice work. Everybody got it right. Um, but again, another really great recording. The quality was incredible. Um, you could see the spectrogram really dark on the screen, which means you're probably pretty close to the bird, uh, which is great for Merlin because the louder the sound is, the easier um, it is for it to identify. Um, so all around, easy recording, awesome bird. Everyone gets a point. So we have one more, uh, or sorry, two more, two more sound questions. Uh, we're going to stick to the bird feeders for both of these questions. Um, again, your feeders are empty, but you hear a new different noise from up in the tree. What species is this? We'll play this one twice. All right, I'll play it again. You can ignore the woodpeckers and the crows in the background. It's that, that bird that's making that really loud raspy call. We'll play it one more time. All right, we will say time is up for voting. And we have some divided opinions here in the audience. 
we have almost an even split between red-tailed hawk and blue jay with a couple votes for broad-winged hawk and a vote for northern mockingbird this is definitely a confusing sound um kyle what did you make of this noise i mean that could that could totally get me um you know a lot of times you know you know blue jays are really good at imitating red-tailed and red-shouldered hawks and you know i've been with some very good burgers and we look at each other and we're like, is that a blue jay or is that a red-shouldered hawk and sometimes you really need the team to be sure um on this one i'm gonna go with blue jay um you know it did sound like a red-tailed hawk but it didn't seem to have that long ascending call that they usually have that extend for like a couple seconds almost and at the end of its call it did this little like yep which almost reminded me of like a, a blue jay call you would hear stand alone so for that one i would i would go blue jay all right merlin thinks this was a red-tailed hawk um and merlin got this wrong this was actually a blue jay this is an incredible recording of a blue jay that's a really really good mimic um and mimics are a really fun case to study uh, with merlin um so I want you all to look at the spectrogram here that this J created. Um, it's almost identical to that of a real red-tailed hawk. It looks like, honestly, just a weaker version of a red-tailed hawk call. Um, and that's amazing. Like, that's incredible work on the Blue Jays' part. Um, but right now, Merlin doesn't have a great way to puzzle this one out. Um, so you, as a birder, um, could walk over to the tree and maybe, like, with your eyes, see the Blue Jay that's screaming and making this noise and note that, okay, no, there's not actually a hawk nearby it's this bird this tiny blue bird screaming that's making this noise um but merlin can't do that the only context merlin has is what is in the spectrogram that you see on the screen here um so merlin totally missed this one um but nice work uh kyle i'm so sorry audience you did not get a point for this one um this was a tricky one i, I feel a little bit bad throwing a trick question in um but there's still one more chance to get a question right we've got our last question here um so merlin's I think one of Merlin's biggest strengths with sound ID is that it's really good at identifying birds in very, very busy soundscapes. Uh, when we choose recordings to use to train Merlin, we intentionally choose really busy ones with a lot of overlapping sounds of many different species calling at the same time, so that Merlin has a lot of practice with really noisy environments. And I'm sure a lot of you have had uh, the experience of a really busy day at your bird feeders that was just so busy and loud that you had a hard time making sense of what was going on out there. Uh, so for this question, I'm going to play a recording and ask you all to give me the number of species that are calling. I don't need to know what the species are. You can guess if you want to. Um, but I just want to know how many different birds do you hear. And I will play this one twice. I'm sorry if it's really obnoxious. I had a lot of fun putting this one together. Um, but here is a very noisy bird feeder. I'm going to play this again. All right, we'll give you all a couple seconds to finish answering. I know that was a lot to take in. All right, and we'll say time is up in the poll. All right, this was a challenging one. Um, kind of an even split between number four and five species um, that the audience thinks might be in this recording, um, but with more people voting for five. Kyle, what did you make of this very busy soundscape? Oh, uh, that was a that was a tough one. I tried writing them down as I was I was getting them, um, and it sounded like to me. I thought there were six in there. I thought I heard a chickadee. I thought I heard a white-breasted nuthatch. I thought I heard a pine siskin. I thought I heard a blue jay. I thought I heard a robin, and I thought I heard a, a purple or a house finch in there as well. No, I, I thought six, but that was tough. 
That was a tough one. That that is really tough. Um, Merlin picked out four species, and I'm willing I'm willing to argue if you want to make a case, but there were four species in this recording. Um, so we had your you got them right. You got pine siskin, black capped chickadee, nut hatch, and a blue jay. Um, so this is this is an area that Merlin really excels in. Um, unlike a human, uh, where you know we only have one brain and it's really easy for us to focus on only one thing at a time. Um, Merlin has a sort of infinite attention span and can focus on all the different birds that are calling at once. Uh, whereas, like I know, I personally would have a very hard time picking out a single bird from this recording, uh, and I would totally get lost in the mix here. Um, but yeah, what uh, Kyle? Did you want to make? Did you want to make a case for any of your birds? I'm totally open to a. Uh, suggestions here the pine siskin in particular made a lot of really really varied noises here right and i was wondering if maybe that was the case um you know i thought at the end i thought i heard a, like a short robin note almost like a like a but yeah let's hear it can we, can we hear it again i want to hear it again no. yeah yeah It's weird. I thought I heard a couple of Robin notes in there, to be honest with you. But you know what? You're right. It might be the Siskins just doing some crazy calls. I thought I almost heard a, a Red Bull in there, too, to be honest. They make crazy noises. Um, but I guess this is a really good example of um, why having those sound recordings for documentation is really important. Like, if you thought you did have a really rare bird in a recording, having that recording um, with that beautiful spectrogram is, is so useful to be able to go back and listen over and over and over to just to, to confirm or deny it, um, you know, depending on, on what's going on there. Um, but well, It also sounded like there was may have been a goldfinch calling in there, too. There, there definitely could have been. Okay, I'm. Maybe we throw this question out. Maybe Merlin missed something. Um, no, it's a, it's a good one. I... <laughs> but um, yeah, cer certainly a challenge. Um, so I want to go over the final scores. I'll, I'll include that last one in here. Um, for the final scores. Um, so final score check. Um, Merlin got eleven questions correct. Uh, audience got eleven, and Kyle got thirteen. Um, so Kyle is the winner. Um, if we throw that last question out, um, the audience and Kyle are both winners, which is awesome. Um, so nice work, everybody. Uh, Kyle, how are you feeling about this? Um, I feel good. And, uh, you know, in the in eBird the e reviewer world, we call that a little bit of job security, everyone, all right? So just give, give me a little bit of credit there, you know. Um, but, nah, this it's tough. And, you know, a big thing with birding is, you know, you get humbled all the time. And, um, and I think that's a big part of learning. And, um you know, Merlin's really been a good tool for a lot of people on kind of helping with that aspect. Um, you know, sometimes uh, I'll be out with other people that have it. And it's nice to kind of almost like double check your work or, you know, have kind of like a second opinion. And, you know, sometimes it's great when people have it recording in their pocket and then if it picks up something, you can go back and listen to it again. So it's a really cool, it is a really cool tool. Um, but, you know, I really do like enjoy, you know, trying to kind of figure stuff out you know, on my own in that kind of respect. But, um, you know, Merlin's a really good learning tool and, and teaching tool. So uh, I appreciate you putting me on here tonight. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I know it can be intimidating being put in the hot seat here like this. Um, so but before we end officially, um, I want to end with a couple notes for all of you in the audience. Uh, we're always working on improving Merlin. Uh, we're working on a couple things behind the scenes right now. We'll have a new model for Sound ID coming out, um, hopefully in April, with a couple new species added to it. Um, and also um, coming before that, we're working on updating the look of the app, um, which will be out later next month. So if all of you want to be one of the first people to uh, try out this new update, you can sign up to be a beta tester at the website that's on the screen here. We can also paste this into the chat if you want a link to click on later. Another note, um, I want to encourage all of you to participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count next week. Um, so it runs from February 16th to 19th. That's a Friday to a Monday. So you've got four days to get out and go birding. 
Um, and this is a really important count for us because February is usually the least birded month of the whole year. But to fully understand birds throughout their whole lives, we need data from the winter too. Um, so your birding during this count, really during all of February, is a huge, huge help to us at Cornell and to scientists all around the world who are using these data. And last, um, just a big thank you um, to Kyle again for competing and to all of you watching in the audience.